Baha'u'llah said, the door of the knowledge of the ancient beauty hath ever been and will continue forever to be closed from the face of men. No man's understanding shall ever gain access onto his holy court. As a token of his mercy, however, and as a proof of his loving kindness, he hath manifested unto men the day start of his divine guidance, the symbols of his divine unity, and hath ordained the knowledge of these sanctified beings to be identical with the knowledge of his own self. Whoso recognizeth them hath recognized God. So today our speaker is Mr. John Wheatley, and his topic is Mysticism for the Modern Age. John Wheatley is a computer scientist and systems programmer who's been working in industry for the last 34 years, while having studied philosophy at George Mason University. Throughout that time, he's been interested in all mystical practices, while always seeking to apply these intangible truths to everyday problems. Since his life encompasses both formal logic and the power of devotion, it has been an interesting journey to find the middle way. And with that, I'll hand it off to Mr. Wheatley. So today I wanted to present for you a topic I call mysticism for the modern age. And just to give you a sense of why it is that I chose this topic and wanted to speak about it, I've always been drawn to the mystical side of religion. When I first became a Baha'i, that's what attracted me to it and really kind of wedded me to keeping with the faith over all of these 35 years that I've been a part of it. At the same time, though, we have a lot of difficult and uh, seemingly intractable problems in the real world. And it was always hard for me to think, well, how do we go from these beautiful mystical truths that seem to be easy to practice if you're a monk or if you go off and uh, withdraw yourself from society? How does that interface with these things we see in the news, with the difficulty that we're facing today? And I really have been finding that the Baha'i faith offers a very interesting and compelling approach to wedding these two things. So I wanted to bring that out in this presentation, how the two uh, cannot be, can be seen as not incompatible, but mutually supportive. So when I say the modern age, what I mean is that um, it's different now than it has been over the past several millennia of human history. And just to give a taste of how this modern age is different, I picked some quotes from various websites out on the internet, just to sort of give you a snapshot of what I mean by modern. So one website said, no country can be totally self-sufficient. In today's global economy, a need exists for international trade. Whereas in the old world, countries were by and large self-sufficient and they used international trade as a way of bringing in exotic things like spices or, or rare items. But each uh, country grew its own food, had its own crops, um, was relatively separated from the others. Uh, not so today. So, and today we're so interdependent that some nation's livelihood uh, requires their trade with others. We have a miracle of instantaneous communication, which this very presentation demonstrates our ability to see and connect uh, with one another instantly over huge distances. I, I see in this chat some of my friends from Virginia, whereas I'm in Northern California, and yet we're able to have this meeting together. Uh, technology is changing how we live. So in the olden days, there were technological advancements, but they came at a slower pace. And today, whole markets, whole uh, developments within society can occur based on technological revolutions that are happening. And they seem to be coming quicker and quicker. So technology is, is really changing how we live and causing the world to move forward. And life expectancy has increased dramatically around the globe. Uh, in, the, in past centuries, there were life expectancies under 50. Uh, and now it's easily uh, possible for people to live into their 80s and 90s. In fact, someone in Japan just passed away last week who was uh, 119 years old. So this is a, a huge difference as well because it creates a different set of social difficulties and problems for us to address. So among these modern problems, I will call them, that we're facing today and we often see in the news are things like racial justice uh, is really coming to a head here in the United States and elsewhere in the world economic stability, uh, resolving these extremes of poverty and wealth happening in the world today, uh, the education of youth, world peace, dealing with climate change, uh, the large scale waste problem is also a very modern problem, energy production and how we make enough energy for everybody on the earth, and misinformation. With this rapid flow of information from place to place also comes the ability to misuse it for misinformation. 
I won't be able to cover all of these problems. I just sort of wanted to pick a couple of them and talk about the faith's uh, approach to them. Um, and before I do that, I will give you a little context about what the Baha'i faith is and why it seeks to approach these problems. But this sort of just sets the stage for what I mean by modern and what I mean by the modern problems that we have to address. Very, very recently, in fact, just last week, um, a, a world governing body for the Baha'is the, that I will mention in just a moment, the Universal House of Justice, said this. They said, until humanity as a whole undertakes to establish its affairs on foundations of justice and truth, it is, alas, fated to stagger from one crisis to another. And this is what we are seeing happening. Without that foundation, without a spiritual foundation of justice and truth, we are just going from one problem to another, trying to patch the difficulty that we're facing, but not addressing the underlying problem, which is causing those difficulties, which is putting us in that position. So this is a religious body saying this. So what is religion? And why would religion have a part to play in dealing with modern problems and the Baha'i faith in particular as a religion? I define religion as a belief in some power or truth beyond what is measurable and a set of guidelines for aligning ourselves with this truth so as to conclude our lives in the highest state of fulfillment. And this is uh, also part of what spirituality is about. Spirituality, I think, is a little bit more personal, a little bit more internal, but religion's giving us this set of guidelines. It's giving us a way to learn about and connect with our spirituality. And humanity, over its history, has had many religions, as we well know, because we have received those spiritual teachings differently throughout time. And so although a church or a structure, a societal uh, organization arises out of the teachings of each messenger of God who has come, I believe that the original message, the part that addresses our spirituality and is trying to connect our spirituality with, with the world and its problems is consistent. It's always the same. The messenger of God comes, gives a, teaches us about our soul, about our nature as human beings, and then tries to give us a way to unleash the power of that soul to deal with whatever the problems are facing us at that time. But the problems change dramatically from, from uh, age to age. The problems that were facing the early uh, Muslims or the problems that were facing the early Christians weren't these modern problems that I just listed. So the Baha'i faith, although it is also a religion, it is a religion meant for this modern time. Uh, it is a, it's a religion here to, to help us address these modern problems. So although I'm definitely presenting the views of a religion in this presentation, there's a fundamental shift in focus, I think, that fits this shift toward a modern age that we're going through. And that is that this message and its desired impact, they're meant for the entire world, uh, for humanity, and not just the believers among humanity. So although Baha'is, we accept Baha'u'llah and commit ourselves to the truth of the origin of this message, that it's divine in nature, we're only stewards of a process that is global in aim. Um, the world is becoming a family. Uh, all this technology, all this information, all of this interlinking and internationality, it is knitting us together and we're becoming a family. And like a family, we cannot be truly happy if only a few of us are safe and secure. So the Baha'i faith, to give just the briefest overview, this is a very deep subject with a lot of different aspects to it. So I can't hope to give you an introduction in the time frame that I have. But to, to kind of give you the, the brief headlining points, it, it began in 1844. So that's how it relates when I say to the modern age. When 1844 was coming around, you were already seeing inventions like the telegraph appear. And it was birthed in the, what, what is today the country of Iran. Uh, then at that time, it was the part of the Persian Empire, but today we would call that uh, Iran. And one of the unique things about the Baha'i faith is that all of its writings are holy books were either written or confirmed by the author of those books. So this isn't the report of what someone said or um, something that was written down long after the founder had passed away. This was actually confirmed in writing by the founder himself. And what the Baha'i faith proclaims is the that this time is the fulfillment of all past promises concerning the dawning of a golden age. But this age is going to come about 
through the process, a long process of maturation. So in a way, the seed has been planted, but now the seed must grow into a tree. But the inevitability of that seed is what is promised. And in, in some ways, it's what I'm going to present today that are some of the, the forms in which this development of the seed is taking place from the Baha'i uh, perspective. The Baha'i faith organizes itself um, by a line of succession from the founder. So here I have God on the far left. He is, of course, the author of all of these things. And he sent several messengers, we believe, uh, messengers such as Muhammad or Christ or the Buddha over time to humanity so that it could develop and mature spiritually by being taught about our spiritual nature and how we could apply that nature to the world. Um, the, the most recent messengers, we believe, were the Bab in 1844 and Baha'u'llah in 1853. And these names mean the gate and the glory of God. So they're Arabic terms that name religious stations. And Baha'u'llah is uh, the author, I would say, of all of these Baha'i writings that I would, I, I'm talking to you about. And I will quote him, though, just once. In this presentation, I'll be quoting more from the Universal House of Justice. Baha'u'llah, uh, when he passed away, this is also unique in religious history, he left a will. And he said that all of his followers should turn to Abdu'l-Baha, his son, and look to him for guidance. And that Abdu'l-Baha had the authority to interpret the things that Baha'u'llah had written. And likewise, Abdu'l-Baha passed that authority down to Shoghi Effendi through his will, Shoghi Effendi being his grandson. And then Shoghi Effendi helped to architect the realization of something that Baha'u'llah had written about, which was an, or an organization termed the Universal House of Justice, which is a body of nine men who are elected by the entire world, Baha'i world, every five years to guide its affairs and give us guidance as we move into the future. So the Universal House of Justice today is seated in Haifa, Israel, and they're the ones that we look to, to understand, well, what is it that the Baha'i faith is going to uh, do now, and what are, what are our approaches going to be in trying to minister to the needs of society? So it's this idea of a cohesive uh, sort of guidance, starting with God and descending through these various individuals to the Universal House of Justice that offers us this access, if you will, to the spiritual guidance and energy that is coming originally from God. So that's very brief. Uh, I'm sorry that it has to be so hasty, but that's a very brief sort of, um, I guess, just even frame for what the Baha'i faith is around these teachings. Mostly I'll be quoting today from the Universal House of Justice. So you get a sense of what is our guidance for today? Not the guidance that Baha'u'llah gave us in 1844, but how has that guidance been refined and adapted by the House of Justice and by these other figures uh, to apply to today's problems? So in speaking about religion in particular, the Universal House of Justice wrote this very beautiful statement um, that I thought captured the essence of it quite beautifully. They said the endowments which distinguish the human race from all other forms of life are summed up in what is known as the human spirit. The mind is its essential quality. These endowments have enabled humanity to build civilizations and to prosper materially. But such accomplishments alone have never satisfied the human spirit whose mysterious nature inclines it towards transcendence, a reaching towards an invisible realm, towards the ultimate reality, that unknowable essence of essences called God. The religions brought to mankind by a succession of spiritual luminaries have been the primary link between humanity and that ultimate reality, and have galvanized and refined mankind's capacity to achieve spiritual success together with social progress. So not only does this quote capture that, that very yearning that I feel within myself that binds me to the mystical and spiritual aspects of this faith and other faiths too. I also love studying uh, Islam and Christianity as well, uh, in particular, but it talks about this conjoining of achieving spiritual success with social progress, not one to the exclusion of the other. Um, and, and it has been taking place through a succession of luminaries sent from God. Um, another thing about religion is that, I mean, religion has been a part of humanity for as long as we can remember. I mean, going back to the beginning of our recorded history, but our relationship to religion, I believe, is evolving. 
And some of the concepts of religion that we have known about for ages, I think that they're evolving as well because we're maturing as a species, we're maturing as a collective global unit. So I wanna give an example of what I mean by that kind of maturation. So I'm thinking about religion in this example, but I'm gonna use a simpler uh, context in which to explain it. And that's the example of going to school. So in a way here, religion is the school. When I went to school and I'm thinking particularly of uh, 11th grade, I did not appreciate the value of English grammar, let me tell you. I, I hated that class. I thought English was my least uh, enjoyable subject because it was presented to me as if it were valuable knowledge, right? This is something you should know, which I never understood why I should know it. I experienced it as a 11th grader as a set of kind of arbitrary rules that were often at odds with my intuitive understanding. I mean, I speak English every day. I, I, know, I know how to say what I mean. Why do I need all of these artificial, what seemed like artificial structures and, and guidelines? So in a way, this is kind of like religion with its ethics and morality. I can't say I was a huge fan of ethics and morality when I was a young person. They seemed like constraints. They seemed just like restrictions. When I read about the history of some of the communities in the past that have tried to really hold themselves tight to religious, um, to religious structures, I thought, well, that's not for me. It seems at odds with becoming a free spirit. So I, I endured the homework that they assigned and I took the tests, but I was taking those tests just to get past them. I would study at the last second. And then when I was done and I saw that I had at least a passing grade, I was so glad because at least it was behind me and I wouldn't have to do it again. And I have to tell you, I got a D in a lot of those uh, semesters of English. Maybe I squeaked by with a C sometimes, but I was no star pupil. And then I grew up, right? I got out of college. I was in, I mean, I got out of high school. It was in college. It wasn't an, oh, an overnight transformation, but after a while, my education started to become part of my own, uh, my own life. I started to own it. And so there was a change in my relationship to English. So as an adult, I came to understand that my intuitive understanding, it was meant to give way to, in, to instruction, right? This intuitive understanding that I had built as a young person just speaking English, it was supposed to give way to this instruction. The instruction was, was there to level me up, to lift me up to a higher level where I could do things not just based on how they felt, but consciously and with awareness. And in that sense, the homework, and the tests that I had hated so much in class, I got to see then that they were foundation building. And they actually were there to help the teacher to help me. And I have to tell you, that was a revelation to understand that the teacher was a partner in this process. It wasn't just English class was inflicted upon me. It was the teacher trying to establish a, a relationship with me so that she could help me. It was Mrs. Daniels, I remember her name well so that she could help me study this subject. And as such, grades were never the objective. And that was a very big surprise to me because when you're in that setting, when you're in high school, it seems like grades are all the only thing anyone ever cares about. All, it's all, all that my parents ever asked me about. But the grades were never the objective. In the end, the only purpose, purpose of those grades, the only person that it helped was myself. Because the grades, the tests, the homework, they existed as a way for the teacher to understand where I needed help or what subject I was ready for. So putting this into the religious context, it changed the way I looked at ethics, the way that I looked at virtue, the way that I looked at all of these laws and, and, and organizational structures that are within religion. There's a, rap a rapport here between me and my soul and God. And God is sending me these things so that I can improve my relationship with him and in doing so be a benefit to society. But the person that it's helping these laws is me because in following them, I'm learning and developing and becoming more of my potential. So that's sort of just how my understanding of religion has been changing. And this change in, in um, my attitude towards ethics and morals, I think society too goes through this change because there have been times in the past where the purpose seemed to, of religion almost seemed to be about the ethics and the morals, that they were the barrier between you and heaven, that the whole reason to follow them 
was to make yourself suitable for salvation. But what if they're just tools, tools to help us unlock our potential and enable us to be able to solve what seem to be intractable problems? So in that sense, then, I have a definition for you of mysticism. This is sort of my own thinking on mysticism evolving as time goes by. But nowadays, I think of mysticism as framing what is seen in the context of what is unseen and guiding our thoughts and actions from this perspective. Um, one of my favorite philosophers of all time, and, I, and as, the, as Par Paramone mentioned, I, I studied philosophy in college. One of my favorite philosophers has always been Plato. And Plato made a comment that struck me deeply once. He said, the philosopher is the man who lives with one foot already in the grave. And what he meant by that was, although the philosopher looks at the world around him and considers it, he also always has in mind the life beyond. And he uses that perspective to put everything that he sees and thinks in context. Uh, and this is something that I think not only has religion always done, but the Baha'i faith in particular is doing and applying to social problems. And that is exactly what I wanna show you today is how it's doing that. The, the, the means by which we're doing this is also very systematic. Uh, it's not just something where we're wishfully hoping that a mystical perspective will help the world's problems. We actually have a purposive institution built around this principle uh, of, on the one hand, framing things in their spiritual context, and in the, uh, on the other hand, of drawing from the reservoirs of spirituality within ourselves and between each other to apply uh, solutions to the problems. And we call it the institute process. I'm not going to go into depth about what these elements of the Institute process are, but it covers a lot of different areas. One of the key and foundational being community devotional gatherings, praying together, no matter whether people are of a religious bent or not, just getting together and having these positive and mindful uh, sessions together in which we think about what we want for the future of our communities, what we want between each other, envisioning the world that we're aiming for. Educational programs for children, youth, and junior youth are also critical because youth have this, un, they're, they're an amazing reservoir for change and uh, advancement. Uh, building capacity even among adults to advance this process by drawing in the participation of all the members of a community. You know, in, in ages past, we looked to a charismatic figure or a hero, you know, in, in the Greek terms, somebody who would be so brilliant so well-spoken, so uh, forward-thinking that everyone could then rally around them and that would draw us into the future. And, and that has happened. There have been individuals who had that impact on the world. But as we become more modernized and as the information is just everywhere, it is going to fall more and more upon the individual members of every community to take charge of their own development in order for this to be a sustainable uh, development. So along, going along with that, these community members would then engage in social and economic development pro projects suited to each locality, to wherever in the world these people may find themselves. And lastly, engaging in social discourse. It, you know, unless we talk about the problems of, of the day in a way that we can maybe not all agree, maybe even not agree on the facts, but where we can stay in the same room and, and speak as adults to one another is gonna be absolutely essential to our ability to find some means of moving forward. But all of these sort of um, institutions and, and approaches, they happen in the context of, some, of another aspect of the institute process, which I call like the learning process. How do we do these things? How do we learn about uh, advancing uh, or developing our communities? And this approach of the institute process, it has to be not top down, but bottom up. Uh, often the word grassroots is used. Something that percolates up from the, the, the communities themselves, of the neighborhoods even, going that local. So I said that this age of heroes has to give way to an age of collaborators, where we're all doing this uh, linked together. And it's done through a process of learning rather than proclaiming. And the difference between these two is that when we proclaim, it's when it's it's that we have a great idea. We think, oh, we know what we know what society should look like. 
this is what is good. This is what is right. And then you come into a setting and you judge what's going on or you judge a community according to that standard and say, oh, well, you need to fix this. You need to fix that. But this, this is not how the Institute process works. We don't have a pre-decided image of what is right for any given uh, place because every place has its own needs, its own um, particularities. And I learned just this week of this wonderful quote from Miles Davis that I thought summed up this learning process so well. He said, if you hit a wrong note, it's the next note you play that determines if it's good or bad. So failure and error and doing something and having it not work out, these actually can be incredibly value lear valuable learning tools. If what you do next is you incorporate what you learned and you try again a different way. But if you allow the mistake to shut things down or to derail the vision that you're aiming toward, that's what makes it good or bad, not its comparison to some ideal image. So the Baha'i faith does not have an ideal image of what society should be. We have a vision for the future of humanity, to be sure, a vision that's incredibly bright in its prospects. But we don't know how that vision is going to come into being here in Northern California or over in Virginia or someplace in India. Um, that has to be determined and evolved from the people themselves. So now I wanna look at just a couple of those modern problems and, and talk about what are the spiritual frames that are around these problems and what the Baha'i faith thinks about beginning to address them. And, be, I meant, and I say beginning intentionally because as I said, we don't already have the answer. We just have a, a, a process for helping us seek answers. And the first is racial justice. And I put this first because this is really coming to a head. I mean, it has been for now centuries, but lately there have been a lot of events that have put this foremost in a lot of people's consciousness. So the spiritual frame for this problem is something Baha'u'llah said. If any man were to meditate on that which the scriptures sent down from the heaven of God's holy will have revealed, he would readily recognize that their purpose is that all men shall be regarded as one soul. Now think about that. <clears throat> this is a person that we as Baha'is believe is a messenger of God. He's bringing us the word of God. And he's saying that all of the, the messengers of God, all of their scriptures have been sent down with one purpose, that all men should be regarded as one soul. There's no possible uh, there's no possibility for prejudice or racial division in that vision. So this is the standard. This is what all of humanity is aiming for. And I don't know how many thousands of years it's going to take until we're all able to regard the whole collective body of mankind as a single soul. But this is the essence, the pith. And this is what makes this problem a mystical one to me. Contrasted against this spiritual uh, ideal is the current very real fact of the consequences of slavery, of people who were brought against their will to this country under horrible circumstances and who were pressed into service and not given any opportunity uh, for their freedom. They were, they were just treated as property. And then even after a war was fought to grant their emancipation, it, it's not that the problem just ended overnight there. It's that then the concepts and the objectives of slavery, they just transformed. They just became more hidden. <clears throat> so, in fact, you know, uh, as I've been thinking about this problem, a lot of my own ideas about it, I've had to, that have just been completely turned on their head. Um, for example, just one of them, when I was growing up, I really thought that racism was a force in society that was the, that was the cause of the oppression and exploitation of Black people. And what I've learned just from reading books is that I had it completely backwards, that the exploitation and the, um, the, the mistreatment of Black people is what caused the creation of racism. Because people were being brought from Africa into Europe and pressed into service and, and, and forced into slave labor. And the people of Europe, they weren't completely evil and immoral. And they asked themselves, is this OK? Is this, all, is this, is this something that we can do? And racism and the idea of white superiority was created so that these morally minded people could continue to think of themselves as moral. 
And then this whole system, this whole social evil has propagated through time and we are the inheritors of it. So in order for us to overcome this violation of moral standards, we have to change not only policy, also our hearts. It can't just be about the problem. It can't just be about anti-racism. It also has to be pro-Black, pro-Indigenous, pro-humanity. So without a doubt, the current structures, the current policies, the current things holding us back have to be addressed because it's, it's not okay to just say, oh, well, all humanity is one. We're going to leave. That. We'll just wait for the rest of the world to catch up. But it's putting that effort and that approach within the spiritual frame of, well, what are we aiming for? Are we just aiming for the cessation of such policies and hope that everyone gets along when they're, when they're done? Or are we aiming for regarding all of humanity as a single soul? So the House of Justice has written some things about this. And I just wanna give you a taste of some of our more recent guidance. So this letter from July 22nd was sent to the Baha'is of the United States just a couple of months after George Floyd was murdered. And they wrote, racism is a profound deviation from the standard of true morality. It deprives a portion of humanity of the opportunity to cultivate and express the full range of their capability and to live a meaningful and flourishing life while blighting the progress of the rest of humankind. It cannot be rooted out by contest and conflict. It must be supplanted by the establishment of just relationships among individuals, communities, and institutions of society that will uplift all and will not designate anyone as other. The change required is not merely social and economic, but above all, moral and spiritual. And what really strikes me in this paragraph is they talk about uh, racism being a deviation from the standard of, standard of true morality, but they don't just say that it affects negatively one group among humankind. They say that it blights the progress of the rest of humanity. That's a very mystical perspective that an issue which is worst among, uh, worst within the United States and worst when addressing uh, black people and indigenous people, yet it has an impact that blights the progress of the whole world. And they say here very clearly that the change required is not merely social and economic, as important as those are, but also moral and spiritual. So again, the sort of this union of these two aspects of social and mystical, uh, you'll find them as a consistent theme. The House of Justice writes in a more recent letter, so this is January of this year, all Baha'is are called to persistently act little by little, to deliberately cultivate freedom from racial prejudice within their daily lives, their families, their community building activities, their involvement with society, and all the social spaces in which they participate, so that they increasingly evince the Baha'i teachings, especially the oneness of humanity. If the friends become founts of love and create environments wherein the spirit and practice of race unity are prevalent, every trace of race prejudice will ultimately be removed. So this kind of gives us the substrate or the, the matrix within which all of our social programs of action are developing, this idea of little by little, day by day, in every single aspect of our lives, seeking to root out this racial prejudice. Now, sadly, I don't have an answer. I can't say what any one of us can just do to go outside right now and attack the policy that's local to your area. It has to evolve uh, through this institute process. How are we going to address this? What are we going to do? But we do know what the spiritual context is and how important this issue is. Uh, the second one is economic stability. And this we've seen in the news quite a lot recently. So the spiritual principle involved is this quote from Baha'u'llah. O ye rich ones on earth, the poor in your midst are my trust. Guard ye my trust and be not intent only on your own ease. You know, in the Bible, when, when Abel had, uh, when, when Cain had killed Abel and then God asked him, where's your brother? He said, am I my brother's keeper? And this quote is really saying that fundamentally we are our brother's keeper. 
that's sort of the principle, having feeling responsibility for each other, caring for each other, looking out for each other as family. That's where we're trying to get to. The reality that we deal with, by contrast, is we have whole nations starving. If you have not read about what's happening in Yemen right now, there is a crisis of enormal, an enormous consequence occurring in that part of the world where the, they believe that it's going to enter into a famine uh, condition very soon if they don't get more aid. And the issue of homelessness in all of the cities uh, in the world is becoming ever worse. Meanwhile, you have displays of exorbitant wealth beyond imagination, <laughs> things that the kings of old couldn't even possibly imagine uh, that are contrasting this poverty. So the other day I read about a restaurant in Hong Kong that serves tea where one small little cup of tea is $3,500. And I thought, how do we have a cup of tea for $3,500 when that could probably provide enough rice and potatoes and, and staple foods for an individual for a good part of a year. So what do the writings say about this? So Abdul Baha, and, and again, I, I wanna give the spiritual flavor of the framework within which we think about these problems. Abdul Baha wrote that the fundamentals of the whole economic condition are divine in nature and are associated with the world of the heart and spirit. This is fully explained in the Baha'i teachings and without knowledge of its principles, no improvement in the economic state can be realized. I've read uh, quite a bit on economics and in the economic textbook I was reading, it never talked about it being divine in nature. You know, we tend to think of economics as about uh, tables, uh, rules, balances, amounts, finance, but the Baha'i writings say that the, heart, the root and the heart of economics are divine in nature and concern the world of the heart and spirit. That kind of blew me away when I first read that. It's not how I used to think about economics in school. Abdul Baha goes on to say more. He says, when the love of God is established, everything else will be realized. This is the true foundation of all economics. Reflect upon it. Endeavor to become the cause of the attraction of souls rather than to enforce minds. Manifest true economics to the people. Show what love is, what kindness is, what true severance is and generosity. Economic questions will not attract hearts. The love of God alone will attract them. Economic questions are most interesting, but the power which moves, controls, and attracts the hearts of men is the love of God. So in economic theory, you may find ideas like the free market, where as long as you keep everything open and allow everyone to trade however it is that they wish they, they want to trade, that sort of there will be this emergent property of the free market that it moves toward social benefit because only if the whole commonwealth is becoming enriched and succeeding will the market flourish. And, and that's in a way just sort of, sort of leaving it up to whatever will happen as a consequence of having a free market. This, this was one of the theses of Adam Smith and his belief in the invisible hand. But here in the Baha'i writings where it roots economic reality in the heart, in people caring about each other. So again, I don't have an answer for you today about how we're going to resolve homelessness or how we're going to feed hungry people in the world. Those are things that have to happen at a local level and they will happen slowly and continuously over time. But I do want us to understand that there is a different uh, way of thinking about these problems than merely the material manifestations of them. In the, the Universal House of Justice again, and they wrote this really beautiful document back in 1986 called The Promise of World Peace. And the more I reread this document, the more I'm struck by the things it says that are applicable today. They said, the inordinate disparity between rich and poor, a source of acute suffering, keeps the world in a state of instability, virtually on the brink of war. Few societies have dealt effectively with this situation. The solution calls for the combined application of spiritual, moral, and practical, practical approaches. A fresh look at the problem is required, entailing consultation with experts from a wide spectrum of disciplines, devoid of economic and ideological polemics, and involving the people directly affected in the decisions that must urgently be made. 
And that last part really is an essential component of the Institute process, involving the people directly affected, not just asking them, bringing them into the table, just developing the solution with them. In fact, letting them develop that solution and then collaborating with them, joining with them. World peace, something philosophers have wanted now for several thousands of years. The Universal House of Justice writes in that same document, so much have aggression and conflict come to characterize our social, economic, and religious systems the many have succumbed to the view that such behavior is intrinsic to human nature and therefore ineradicable. As the need for peace becomes more urgent, this fundamental contradiction, which hinders its realization, demands a reassessment of the assumptions upon which the commonly held view of humanity's historical predicament is based. So we've wanted world peace for all these years, and we've looked to our material and social inability to achieve it and come to the conclusion human beings are basically incorrigible. If you've got a whole bunch of us in a room, we're going to create chaos. And so only law or enforcement or stricture is going to sort of corral us into a reasonable state of affairs. Because we hold that as a fundamental perspective on who we are and our potential, it limits our ability to dream for peace. It limits our vision of what we can do if we simply come together at the same table. And the House of Justice continues, with the entrenchment of this view, a paralyzing contradiction has developed in human affairs. On the one hand, people of all nations proclaim not only their readiness, but their longing for peace and harmony, for an end to the harrowing apprehensions tormenting their daily lives. On the other, uncritical assent is given to the proposition that human beings are incorrigibly selfish and aggressive, and thus incapable of erecting a social system at once progressive and peaceful, dynamic and harmonious, a system giving free play to individual creativity and initiative, but based on cooperation and reciprocity. I remember in my philosophy class, I had this really great professor in Virginia, actually. His name was uh, Wal um, Walter Ehrlich. Um, no, Walter Verle. Walter Verle. And he was, uh, he was a, a Aristotelian. But one of the things he talked about on several, in several of his classes was the number of times human beings have tried to create utopian societies. It was way more than I had ever imagined. But throughout history, there have been groups of people who have decided, you know what, we're gonna take Plato's Republic, that ideal uh, that he had of a just society, and we're gonna to get together a whole bunch of like-minded people and try to make that city and then become a model for the rest of the world. And every one of these utopian experiments failed, which kind of led people to this assumption that, oh, it's just too hard to do, we can't do it. But they also did it with only a mental, with only a social uh, mindset. None of those were spiritually based. And so I think that that is essential. I think we have to consider who we are, that as human beings, we're not merely evolved animals. Uh, evolved animals, if, if left to their own devices, would just go after what is of their most uh, material benefit. But as spiritual creatures, altruism is natural to us. Uh, caring for one another is natural to us. And it is spiritual education that will bring these qualities to the forefront. So speaking of uh, spiritual education, the last one I wanted to mention briefly was the education of youth. Um, I wanted to find something from Baha'u'llah that would be uh, sort of give the essence of what the importance of this is, but I couldn't find anything in the time allotted. So I did find this statement though from the Baha'i international community. So that's a, that's a Baha'i group that interfaces between the Baha'i faith and international organizations like the United Nations. And they wrote, the involvement of youth is not something to be sought for their sake alone, nor a tool designed to advance their needs as a, as a specific population group. Rather, it is a component critical to the well-being of all of humankind, young and old alike. And there you find again that, that sort of mystical perspective where a thing in the small has a reality in the large that goes well beyond it. 
Contrasted with this ideal is the fact that because of poverty and marginalization in the world today, there are more than 72 million children who remain unschooled. And when you think about 72 million, although we have 7 billion still, that's 1% of the entire population of the earth is 72 million. And if you look at intelligence tests, <clears throat> the way that intelligence is measured is it's an exponential scale of um, rarity. So if a person has, for example, 150 IQ, it means that roughly one out of every 2000 people will have that same IQ. And every point you go above that, it's, it's, it either doubles or I forget the rate at which it increases, but it increases very fast. So that by the time you get to 170, this is just incredibly rare. It's like one in every 100,000. But 72 million, that's, that's a lot of room for that statistic. So think of how many of those unschooled children due to poverty and marginalization are just geniuses that could be assisting the development of humanity, but who never get that opportunity because we're unable to educate them. Um, Abdul Baha said, and he, he, he said something very important about education. Education isn't just something we have to do so that people can become functional members of society. Abdul Baha said something much stronger. The education and training of children is among the most meritorious acts of humankind and draweth down the grace and favor of the all merciful. And then he said, for education is the indispensable foundation of all human excellence and alloweth man to work his way to the heights of abiding glory. So that this for, for a religion to come forward and say that education is this important is a novel thing. And, and not just education for one group, but education of all. The House of Justice in the year 2010 said, and they gave again another, another spiritual frame to understand the education of youth. While global trends project an image of this age group, junior youth, so this is like 10 to 14, as problematic, lost in the throes of tumultuous physical and emotional change, unresponsive and self-consumed, the Baha'i community, in the language it employs and the approaches it adopts, is moving decidedly in the opposite direction. Seeing in junior youth instead altruism, an acute sense of justice, eagerness to learn about the universe, and a desire to contribute to the construction of a better world. And when I read this, I thought of how much media affects us, the TV programs we watch, movies, just things that we consume as part of our uh, mem membership in society. And when you look at youth, especially young youth, as they're shown in TV shows, you know, they're always just absorbed in their devices. They're sort of only concerned about themselves. Uh, they seem to be chaotic and, and difficult to manage. And, you know, if only they will get past this stage of immaturity. But the Baha'i faith takes a very different view. That these young people, these very young people who are at this nascent phase of their development as human beings, they possess powerful capacities. And it only requires a good educator to tap and realize those possibilities. So that's sort of the spiritual frame, the institute process, and the way that the institute process seeks to engage spiritual forces in, to bear on these social problems and to, and to, and to, um, to solve them in, the, in this spiritual context. I wanted to conclude at the end of this with just a brief uh, six minute video that gives you some of the uh, a flavor of how this is taking shape around the world. And at the beginning of this video, you're going to see first a building, which is the Shrine of Baha'u'llah in Israel. Um, that's where the video begins. It sort of shows you that building, and then it starts to zoom out. And it then shows you many Baha'i temples around the world. And one of the things about these temples that's interesting is that they mirror this very process I've been talking about today. Because each temple is built with nine sides representing the nine world religions and the temples are open to everyone anyone can come it's not just for a baha'i congregation but anyone can come whether to pray or to just sit in mindful silence so that's the spiritual foundation that it lays then around this temple baha'u'llah stated 
that dependencies of this temple should be built. Wherever there is one of these temples, these dependencies should also spring up. And each one of them addresses a different aspect of society. So there should be a hospital, a house for orphans, uh, a home for the elderly. Like these are the dependencies of these temples so that the temple isn't only about prayer and meditation. It's about spirituality in the midst of social engagement. So here is that video. The fundamental purpose animating the faith of God and his religion is to safeguard the interests and promote the unity of the human race and to foster the spirit of love and fellowship amongst men. As the life of humanity undergoes a process of profound change, across the globe, followers of Baha'u'llah, in the company of their friends, are striving with great enthusiasm to put into practice his teachings. Working shoulder to shoulder with neighbors and colleagues, they are learning how to build vibrant and prosperous communities. Communities that begin to reflect a united and illumined new world. The revelation of Baha'u'llah has the power to transform society. For the last many decades, we've been learning how to take that revelation and apply it in order to affect the spiritual and material progress of society. Around 20 years ago, we reached a turning point a process that started to unfold was a systematic training of, of individuals to build their capacity in order to be effecting change in, in their communities. We have now this tool, this instrument of limitless potentialities that is helping us to develop our capabilities to actually translate what has been written in Baha'u'llah's writings into very practical action. And maybe then the question before us now is how do we bring more and more friends into this process so that together as a collective we can really advance in our capacity. Vamos a memorizar una cita. La cita de Bajaula es una cita muy bella que nos va a enseñar a tener un corazón puro. Oh, hijo del Espíritu. Mi 
tunashukuru kwa kufika kuona group mm. au sikse gani ni ushapata depuis ça ulianza fungula group yako ya vapresent ni baba in October 2017, people from every walk of life gathered in homes and halls, parks and universities to celebrate the bicentenary of the birth of Baha'u'llah. When I think about the bicentenary celebrations, I think one of the things that we've seen is how ready people are now to speak of the life of Baha'u'llah and of his teachings directly, and how ready people are to hear them. And I think that has been a change. Baha'u'llah has traído estas herramientas para realmente transformar nuestras vidas individuales y colectivas. El Bicentenario nos llevó a otro nivel de acción colectiva. As more and more souls learn to apply the Baha'i approach to building vibrant communities, populations around the world are increasingly spurred into action, learning to take charge of their own development. Baha'u'llah, además de que nos da ese sentido de propósito, ya como individuos, nos indica claramente cómo podemos Eh, cumplir ese propósito en base a las interacciones que tengamos con los demás. Uno ve personas, uno ve grupos, uno ve comunidades donde la llegada ¿no? de las enseñanzas bajáis fue el punto de partida hacia nuevos niveles de mejor calidad de vida. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Mr. Weigley. Um, it was a really, really uh, great presentation. We really enjoyed it. Um, so now we have some time for Q&A. So if you have any questions, you can go ahead and put it in the chat. The first question is, is there a difference between mysticism and spirituality? I think that mysticism is, I would call it a study of spirituality. It is realizing that we have this unnameable, unknowable entity, this, this soul that we're partnered with, that really is our life and the origin of our, of our being. And then mysticism seeks to bring consciousness of that soul to the foreground and have it really color and guide all of our actions and our approaches. It spiritualizes the understanding and approach to life. Thank you. Um, are there examples of actions that are addressing racism that you know of? Uh, so one of the things that I'm engaged in right now is called Copper to Gold, a transformative approach to anti-racism. And what we're trying to do is get groups of, um, groups of black and white people together in dif different discussion groups. And we have a 16 week program that we en engage in. And we're really trying to understand the ways in which whiteness and uh, racism have affected us as individuals, because we're brought up in this culture and in this society, and we're taught to assume things from birth, really, about who we are, our potential, our meaning, and our value as human beings. And unless we very realistically examine these things and become aware of them in our hearts and in our minds and how they've affected us, it, we won't be able to have an honest and sincere and very realistic discussion with each other about what we're going to do to address these problems. Because for example, white privilege has not only given me a voice in certain ways, it has also suppressed the voice of others in many ways. So I need to be aware of my pr privilege to be aware of how it is that my speaking affects others and the way that I enter a space. So. In, in doing this and having this program, and if anyone wishes to know more about that program, please please email me. Uh, I, I will say it for anyone watching this, it's jwigley at gmail.com. 
and I'll put it into the chat as well. And I can tell you uh, more about the program, but this is just, I see it as a foundational piece of making it possible to have the conversation uh, in an honest and direct way. Uh, but there are many, many activities going on in the United States right now. I see people in the, the screen of names in front of me who are engaged in some of those things. You know, just this past week, I was in Chicago because the, um, the Baha'is are guided at the international level by the Universal House of Justice at the national level by our national spiritual assemblies. And we have an election process each year that determines the membership of that national spiritual assembly. And it takes place in Chicago. So I was there to be a part of that process. And in that process, we have consultation at the national level, informing each other of all of the things that have been happening across the United States. And what was unique about this year was not only how often the topic of racism and racial prejudice and racial justice came up, but how interwoven it was with all of the other topics in, under discussion. There's been this evolution of consciousness that it's not a problem on the side to be addressed while we also are dealing with all of these other things. Rather, until we eradicate this racial prejudice and this, this even unconscious belief that others might be better or less than another, until that's extirpated from the heart, it's going to be very difficult to proceed in any other way because this process is spiritually founded. And when anything is spiritual, it, evolves, it involves not only the mind, but the heart. And if the heart has this cancer of racism within it, it can never operate to its fullest capacity. So uh, I'm happy to talk more with people um, if they want to know after this. Thank you. Logic and reason is valued, respected, and honored and has a certain primacy in society today. Yet its importance seems completely secondary and subordinate to another principle, namely unity and harmony among individuals, the love of God and selfless service to others. If we base our lives on the values of logic and reason, what problems might this lead to if it isn't supported by the more fundamental values of human oneness, fellow feeling, and genuine altruism? That is quite a question. <laughs> I like it. Um, I think that one of the dangers of logic and reason is that logic and reason are founded on human understanding. Every single logical system we currently have today is based in axioms that we ourselves invented. You know, no one gave us tablets from the mountain that, that prescribed a logical system. Instead, we invented set theory and group theory and category theory and symbolic logic and all of these systems. Those systems can only take us as far as the brilliance of their creators. It's a human-made construct that is very useful, very valuable, but it's limited in its nature from the get-go. I'll give you an example of this. Um, science proceeds by examining the physical world and then determining what are the set of principles that move that world, that explain the things that we see. So we come up with theories that are, that are founded in our logic, uh, like Newtonian mechanics. And it offers a very compelling explanation. And in fact, it works. For 99% of our physical needs, Newtonian mechanics works. It allows us to send people to the moon. It allows us to build uh, airplanes and, and sailing boats. It, it satisfies our needs. But we know since the early 1900s that it's wrong. It's not a complete description of reality. So Einstein gave us another view of reality and quantum mechanics has given us another view of reality. And we then realized that we had to evolve. We had to, to refine and develop our understanding of the world. And that process isn't over yet. It's going to keep happening. So this humble recognition that the logic we use today is merely a tool. And it's a tool that has limits endemic to its own creation and where it came from. That's essential for us to progress in a learning mode, in a way in which we can freely cast off the old in order to welcome the new. Whereas the, uh, the principles of unity and harmony and spirituality, those are truth. Like that's, that, I would say that from a Baha'i point of view. Those are a part of our reality, a part of our creation. Now we will, of course, understand unity and harmony in various different ways as humanity evolves. But those uh, were working from a, 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 an attribute of our very creation in that respect. Thank you. 
if science alone can establish slash prove the oneness of humanity, why is there a need for spirituality and religion? I think it's because proof alone does not satisfy the human heart. You can show somebody that two people ought to be like brothers because they have such genetic similarity, but it doesn't mean that they'll act that way. It doesn't promise a harmonious and uh, fruitful collaboration. I think spirituality is what teaches us not of just our materially founded oneness, but the fact that our own happiness as spiritual beings is bound up in our oneness. Thank you. Um, where can we find your talk on the seven valleys? Uh, if you go to YouTube and you would just Google for uh, my name and seven valleys, then you will find it. So question is, um, I've always been fascinated by the beautiful, mysterious concept of the interminglings of this world with the hidden realm and how that next world can affect us and help us discover things and solve problems if we're open to it. Please comment on this. Yes, I actually really love this too. And in, in everything that I think about, I try to take this perspective of, of the hidden realm and how it's involved. And an analogy occurred to me while I was writing, writing an email to somebody else this week, which is when I was a child, I planted a seed into the ground. I remember being four years old and planting an apple seed in my yard in Wisconsin. But now as an adult, when I plant, I plant a tree. I don't just plant a seed because now I'm conscious and I'm aware of the potential that is within that seed. And when I plant it, I'm thinking in terms of that potential. I'm thinking of the tree that will come about and the fruits of that tree. So when I look at material things and material realities, I'm looking at the seed, but I, I, I seek to see the tree. And when I see the tree, it really, that's what orients me to the proper relationship to that thing. Um, in the Baha'i Faith, we have these institutions I was mentioning, the Universal House of Justice, the National Spiritual Assembly, and they're, they're, um, they're consultative bodies of nine people. And these nine people get together and they consult and they write letters and they send us things. And their actions, of course, are the actions of human beings. I mean, the Universal House of Justice is divinely guided, but our National Spiritual Assembly, these are human beings trying their best as a consultative body. But when I enter into the presence of this National Spiritual Assembly, I think to myself, the people who make it up, the, the decisions they make in their consultations, that's just the surface. That's like the tip of a spiritual iceberg. In fact, I'm in the presence of a spiritual reality that is going to continue maturing and becoming deeper and greater in scope as the centuries pass on. So what I try to do is in my heart, I try to regard it as it will be instead of as it is. And I think that is a mystical shift. <laughs> um, Abdul Baha wrote, by faith is meant first conscious knowledge and second, the practice of good deeds. How do you explain conscious knowledge? I, I, I tend to think from the usage of those terms that he means um, bringing, uh, uh, bringing hidden realities into sight. So trying to, trying to understand the potentials of things uh, and making them practical and applicable. But it, it's a very good question. I, I don't have offhand, I think, a very uh, deep answer. Thank you. Um... Okay, so thank you so much again. We really appreciated this talk, really uh, it hit on a lot of themes, but it was also really inspiring. So we appreciate your time today. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so our speaker next week will be Dr. Mikhail Sergeyev and his topic is the concept of reason, the enlightenment philosophy compared with the Baha'i writings. So these are every Saturday at noon Eastern time. And I've put the link to our contact form in the chat and we'll end today with um, another Baha'i song.
Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next Saturday. Bye.